Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream session. I am so excited to be here with you all today. We are going to be talking about claiming your seat at the table with confidence. Um, thanks again for joining us. My name is Haley Katzman. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Vice President of Revenue Strategy at HighSpot. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to these four amazing women um, on how to claim their seat at the table. Um, over the next hour, we're going to take a look at some of the most pressing issues that women are facing in the workplace today. Um, and so joining me for this session, I'm going to let each person introduce themselves. Um, Kat, we will go ahead and start off with you. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Kat Pereira. Um, I use she or they pronouns, and I am a software engineer at Highspot. Awesome. Jess, how about you? Hi, my name is Jessica Turner. I'm based in the UK, and I'm a sales manager at Highspot. Great. Thanks, Jess. Julie? Hi, my name is Julie Levine. I use pronouns she, her, and I'm the director of account development at Highspot. Awesome. And when? Hey everyone, I'm Wen O, and I'm a uh, senior services executive at Highspot. Awesome, perfect. Thanks everyone, we're so excited to jump in today. Um, but before we dive into the conversation, I really wanna take a moment and just kind of reflect on why we're even here today. Um, I think despite a lot of the progress that we have made over the last few decades, women really have yet to reach parity with men at work. And today we're seeing unprecedented numbers of women that are leaving the workforce and they still remain pretty dramatically underrepresented in senior leadership, especially women of color. Um, and COVID has brought, you know, <laughs> to top it all off, a lot of additional roadblocks. You know, one in three mothers have considered leaving the workforce or downshifting their careers. Jess, I know you're a new mom. Um, as we look at these challenges, new and old, our goal today is really to offer practical tips um, women and actually all represented, underrepresented groups can use to claim their seat at the table with confidence. Um, so I'm going to get started. Let's just jump right in um, with our first question for Kat. So Kat, um, we both have been mentored and are mentors. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about why this relationship um, has been so important to you and how it's so important to elevate women and gender diverse people in the workplace? Yeah, good morning, Haley. Um, so I, I definitely think that mentorship is very important um, for underrepresented folks. I can speak a little bit to my own personal story around that. Um, I know without my mentors in the beginning, it I, I would not be as successful as I am today. I'm gonna to kind of use a little bit of an analogy. So I was a intern um, coming in brand new to tech and it feels a little bit like walking into a party where you don't really know anybody. And I walk in and there's just a bunch of people speaking a language I don't know and everyone is very, very tall. And I know one person and that is my mentor. And this mentor can either introduce me, help me to feel welcome here in this space, or they can treat me like I am a, you know, a burden or somebody to just kind of tag along or whatever. So I was very, very fortunate and I have a very awesome mentor and um, helped me to feel welcomed from the beginning um, and to help me to feel like I belong. So I think in the beginning, there's that need for belonging. Um, as I grew and as the relationship grows, I think that having a trustful relationship with a person who is a mentor, they can, they can provide you with feedback that is either you know, assurance that you are doing a great job or give you the feedback that you, know, you need to shift a little bit and shift your priorities. So having, having that kind of relationship with someone to act as a beacon who you trust, I think is just super important. <laughs> Yeah, trust is absolutely critical to having a great mentorship and, and relationship there. I'm curious, Kat, for you and then maybe even anyone else as well following that, how did you get your mentors and how do you kind of know if they're successful or if it's not successful, if you should continue it, if you should not? How, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Um, so how I get my mentors, um, I've been assigned mentors before. Um, I've sought out folks that I thought would make a great technical mentor, okay. um, doing like a flash mentorship kind of a thing. 
And I've also had folks reach out to me asking if they could mentor me, um, seeing something in me wow. that they would help to help to grow. Yeah. Um, communication is very important. It's very important for me personally that I feel safe enough um, because I need to be able to openly communicate and share vulnerabilities. Um, engineering mm -hmm. is very, very challenging and you're failing all the time. <laughs> so I need to be <laughs> able to honestly say, I really don't know what I'm doing here um, yep. with, with a person um, and for ha to have them not judge or, you know, judge me in a way that makes me feel belittled or anything like that. So that that's super important to me. And I do think that it's important to be able to recognize those signs when things are not going quite in a way that is helping or, you know, if things are too stagnant or things are too quick. Um, being able to recognize that and not make it be a thing that's personal. Just, you know, this is a working relationship and this is sort of sort of what that is yeah yeah that's great I love that piece and you and I've um, talked about this before but that flash mentorship concept I know that you've said you know you could have a long-term extended um mentor mentor you could have a flash one that's maybe oriented around a specific goal or something that you're looking to accomplish or it could even be just you know a one-time conversation I'm curious you know for for anyone else um you know for people that are listening they're like hearing this probably and saying okay great like I want to mentor or I want to mentor someone like how did, what would you tell them? Like, how did you get your mentors and maybe even like the best ones that you've had? Like how, what, what's like an actionable step that people could take? Maybe Jess, do you have any advice there? Yeah, I would look at the people that are potentially top of your field. They don't necessarily need to be within your business. I've had mentors before, especially when you reach out to women, um, you know, the good ones are really happy to pass it forward. And, yeah. you know, I've written little inspirational emails on LinkedIn going, you have the job I want. Can I get, you know, a quarterly <laughs> catch up with you and right. I'll have an agenda and I'll come ready and it won't just be a coffee or a chat. Like there's things right. I really want to know from you. I'm yet to be turned down on something like that if you right. position it well. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's so important. Like, what do you want to get out of the mentorship? Um, that's so important instead of it's just, you know, hey, I want to get to know you and there's no agenda. There's no clear, like, what's the win-win kind of out of this. So having a, a really clear concept of what am I looking to get for this mentorship also will probably help guide you on who you should go to to try and look for that mentorship. And that, that can be really different. Um, for anyone here that's on the call, um, maybe when I'll ask you this one, if someone wanted to have you as a mentor, how would you want them to approach you about that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, we were just chatting before the panel uh, about how half the battle is knowing what you want and what you need. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, I think it, it does behoove any relationship, uh, professional, a uh, professional relationship to be able to step into that conversation opening with, hey, this is how I think this relationship is going to benefit me and might benefit you. Um, this yeah. is what I'm hoping to learn from you or glean from you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just having just the way that Jess described, uh, you know, approaching someone to say like, hey, I want to learn from you. These are the outcomes I'd like to derive. That's probably yeah. the best thing to do. Awesome. That's, that's great. Okay, cool. So building off of that idea of mentorship, I think we, you know, got a lot of really great things that people can take away from this. I know Jess, you have also had some really important experiences with mentors and you have a unique word for them, which I really <laughs> like. I'm definitely going to use this, um, is business coach. Can you tell yeah. me a little bit more about that? I know that you and Kat are in different fields. You're in the sales world, Kat's in the engineering world, but tell me from, you know, from your standpoint, what does a business coach mean to you and, and what has your experience been with that? So I absolutely have always had mentors, but they're for me have sat sort of more in an ivory tower of, you know, I want to be you someday and, and tell me about how you got there and it'd be more yeah. of a career aspirational engagement. For me, yep. I've personally had business coaches, some paid, some unpaid throughout certain inflections in my career. And a coach for me is driving a specific outcome. So yep. what's the specific goal? What's the specific target? or yeah. skill set, or what you, What exactly are you trying to move the needle on? And the engagement yeah. isn't forever. It's often a short spurt mm. of, for example, I transitioned from being a lawyer into selling, never mm. sold before. And I, I paid a sales coach 
to take me through the first 30, 60, 90 days yeah. and land effectively. And currently, um, High Spot have provided me, um, firstly, Jason Kim and now Bree Tobin, mm -hmm. sales manager coaches, because I've never right. been a sales manager. Yeah. So I'm able to take specific problems literally to Bree every week and have her coach me on how to deal with that the next day. So mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've found them to be incredibly effective and it's yeah. outcome based and it's not a relationship that you potentially would have forever, like a mentor. Yeah. It's almost kind of what Kat had mentioned about the flash mentorship, but then it sounds mm -hmm. like the add on with it is, you know, it's probably in your field around the skill sets that you're looking to develop with a specific outcome. So like, you know, mentorship could be related to the specific job that you have, or it might not be, but this business coach is like goal oriented, kind of the flash concept. Um, and really meant to help you build your skills. And I think it's, it doesn't have to be either, or you don't have to have a business coach or a mentor. It absolutely could be both. And, you know, they can help you grow in different ways. Um, so I absolutely love that. Okay. So question um, on this. So I know that you have had business coaches that are, um, you know, male, female, similar personalities, different personalities, you know, in the same region as you, different regions, all, you know, all different kind of perspectives. How have you found um, ways to teach someone to manage, lead, and coach you in a, way, in a way that brings out your best self? Yeah, I think you have to be very specific on who you select. So, mm -hmm. When I was aligned with Jason Kim at High Spot on, um, you know, my first sales manager position, the business aligned him with me, and his personality is the polar opposite of what I yeah. am. Uh, yeah. His skill set far, far beyond me. So many more years of selling and coaching and training teams, but that, the business deliberately aligned the difference. I mm -hmm. don't need more rah rah. I need to be more thoughtful. When and when you're dealing with teammates that are different from you, having a more of a, a reflective approach um, was very helpful. So mm -hmm. aligning on skill set and aligning on the outcome you want to drive and personality really helps guide and deliver, you know, a good experience for you as someone right. that's being coached. And so the person that like is your coach, you know, Jason, let's just say early on, might not have known the ins and outs of you, Jess, right? And so is that something where you... Um, kind of gave him the download on, on you so that he knew how to best coach you, if that makes sense. I'm like a one page book, Haley. So it was pretty easy <laughs> to read me. <laughs> but notwithstanding that, a really good coach knows how to do that really rapidly. Mm -hmm. And you have to be open to being vulnerable. Um, that's why I sometimes think having coaches outside of the business that you're currently in mm -hmm. as well is really helpful, especially a paid engagement because yep. you can fully download, this is what I'm not good at. This is where I feel weakness right. and not feel it's going to be, you know, traveled back to your manager. And, and, and right. in my case, obviously it wasn't, but you need to be vulnerable. You need to be really honest with what you're not good at and what you're trying yeah. to achieve and check the ego at the door before you enter the session. Sure. Otherwise it's a waste of time. Yeah. 100% check the ego. I've definitely found that when coaching people, the, the, person that you're coaching or even maybe even the mentee, the level of self-awareness that they have and that they can bring to the table, um, like really directly correlates with the rate at which they can progress and grow because you can just like cut to it, get to it really fast and have a conversation. Um, and so I think like really great coaches, like you said, just can kind of peel the layers back to understand the individual. But if you can enter that relationship with like, Hey, let me tell you, like, here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses. This is where I need help. Like you can just hit the ground running so much faster. And so I think that's like a good way to even approach, um, a mentor relationship, a uh, coaching relationship, any, anything like that. I'm curious if there's something specific, um, for you, Jess, or really, um, anyone as well, um, is there something that you can kind of tell a story around that, you know, you had a coach that helped you achieve something that you wouldn't necessarily have been able to achieve on your own if you hadn't had the coach? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, my first sales job, I <laughs> was top performing rep within a year. Um, I had a paid engagement with a, a sales coach on a weekly basis that gave me homework that was practical that on the Monday I could do and apply in the office fanatical prospecting, how to drive a sales cycle. And it yeah. was just so practical and related to the goal and objective of just being successful in that new transitional role that I'd never yeah. sold before. And by the end of the year, absolutely, I was top performing rep for the team. Yeah, awesome. That's great. I would have drowned without it. 
I would have drowned <laughs> without it. The learning curve's too high. Right. Yeah. And, and that's okay. I think that's, you know, um, you know, Julie, you and I've talked about this a little bit, but being comfortable being uncomfortable, right. And putting yourself in those situations is a big part of it. And it sounds like, you know, it, if you do throw yourself in those uncomfortable positions, having that mentor, that coach to, you know, support you there is, is a big way to kind of get, get through it and really accomplish those goals. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like you mentioned, bringing the self-awareness to the table and being <laughs> comfortable with your mentor to lay everything out on the table and call out the things that you recognize may not be your strengths. Um, yeah. Always help uh, the relationship with your mentor move forward even faster um, and they can help you mitigate your weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Um, so I think with that, you know, never be afraid of recognizing what you want to work on. And that's where I think your mentor will bring the guidance and support or tips and point you in the right direction for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Okay, cool. So, um, I, I really like the perspective that you brought Jess on, you know, achieving specific outcomes. I think that that's really, really important and always staying kind of, you know, oriented around that. Um, in a similar vein, I want to ask my next um, question to when, um, so as women, I would say that it's, becoming more common for us to be invited to the table, which is great. We're making progress here. Um, but I've heard this conversation come up so often. Um, it's often the case that um, women aren't seen as strategic thinkers. Um, and so I'm curious, um, does this speak to your experience at work? What are, what are your kind of your thoughts on this piece? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that is a great question. Uh, in my experience, I have experienced varying levels of just feeling boxed in, if I were to generalize that. And it may be based on others' perceptions of me, whether it's because I'm the only woman in the room, I'm the only person of color in the room, or maybe I appear to be the youngest person in the room, mm -hmm. um, or maybe none of the above, right? But just that feeling of you know, be, being limited. Mm -hmm. um, but before, before I share about my experience, I would actually love to kind of pass the mic back to you. I think mm -hmm. I don't speak for myself when I say I want to hear your, your perspective on this. So what can you share about that? Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's like my um, title has the word strategy. <laughs> in it. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, I think that one thing that's kind of important is that um, it's, it's kind of important to even level set on when we say like strategic thinkers and strategy, like what do we even mean? What are we even talking about? And so I think one of the things that's really important is that um, when you're looking at building, growing a business, um, you know, you're developing what the strategy is. How are we going to grow the business? How are we going to mitigate risk? And then you go and execute, right? And so that bridge between strategy and execution is really, really important. And so um, when you're in more of an execution role, I think, you know, being able to get to that next level, earn the next challenge, grow in your professional career, a lot of times what the conversation anchors around is, you know, how strategic are they? Can they make an impact on the business? And what that really means is, can the individual step back, look outside of the like execution details, kind of more of the tunnel vision, and can you think about the broader business, the broader picture, and how we're going to make an impact, whether that's growing the business, mitigating risk, whatever it is, but looking at that bigger picture so that the decisions that you're making, whether it's recommendations or even, even maybe in execution scenarios, they are um, focused on the bigger, broader picture and driving impact across the business, whether that's in your role, in your team, in your function or not. It could even be in something completely adjacent to you. And so when you think about that, a lot of that has to do with like how you think about approaching scenarios. I think one of the challenges that happens quite often, especially um, with women and generally underrepresented groups is that there's a communication element to being strategic. You have to be able to communicate what is in your head and people have to listen and then be able to internalize what you've said and then act on it. And so if you think about communication, I think that there are a lot of challenges, especially if, you know, there's a leadership team that um, is of all white male, right? Mm -hmm. Then that might mean that they aren't familiar with or having similar perspectives to the people that might be able to give strategic thoughts and drive impact on the business. And so I think that, you know, one is like, can you think about being strategic? And then two is, can you effectively communicate that? Do you have the space to communicate that? And so I think that from mm -hmm. a leadership standpoint, 
you have to create space for people. And a lot of times you have to extract it from people. And a lot of Mm. what that comes back to is having clear, back to like what Jess was saying, clear goals, clear ways of communication, clear ways of extracting that from people, giving them the space to have those thoughts and coaching and developing them on how to think more strategically. So I think um, I really like to break it down into those two pieces of, you know, can you think strategically, but then are you being perceived as strategic because you have the space and the advocacy and everything to actually be able to communicate that so that people can, you know, hear the, hear the thoughts that you, that you have. And I think that's something that, um, that we as a, you know, population need, need to work on a little bit more. (laughs) Mm. Yeah. I, I love what you shared because it's not just about what can I as an individual do to overcome these barriers, but you're also putting thought into what can leaders do to create that space for Mm -hmm. folks to be able to step into more strategic roles and be able to express in that way. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing. I'm definitely taking mental notes. (laughs) Um, So in my experience as just an IC, an individual contributor without the title strategy in my role. Um, how I have found uh, is most of what I found to be most effective in managing the box that folks may put me in uh, essentially comes in three steps. I'm going to get pretty uh, prescriptive about this. Uh, mm-hmm. And the three steps are to take an audit. Mm-hmm. Second is to check in with myself. And the third is to take up more space. And so I'll explain all of those. Um, so in that first step, and this is a really, I think the most important step because you have to decide to take this step um, is to take an audit. And what that means is I sense this box. It's making me feel some kind of way. Mm-hmm. And what what is this box? What are, what are the restrictions of this box? And who is putting me in this box? Who do I perceive as putting me in this box? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, This is really important because if I don't acknowledge the thing that's making me feel limited or small or, you know, the thing that's holding me back, essentially, it will have unrestricted influence over how I show up. And I'll have very little power in changing that, right? So it's kind of like just giving it free reign over over me. Um, And the other part of it around pinpointing exactly who is putting me in that box That's also important because if I generalize it to everyone, oh, everybody thinks I'm not strategic. Everybody thinks I'm not, um, you know, fit for the job. Then I'm already in a losing battle to begin with. Absolutely. And um, there have been times when we're trying to pinpoint, uh, trying to pinpoint who's putting me in the box. Sometimes I find that that person is me. I'm the only Mm. person that told myself, no, you can't do this, you Mm -hmm. know? So that's like the most important, the most important step of those, of this three-step thing that I'm talking about. Um, And then the second step after figuring out, after doing the audit is to just check in with myself. How am I feeling? Do I agree with this box? Um, And that ultimately helps me to then do the third step, which is to take up more space. It's hard to go from here's my feelings and here's the action, right? Um, yeah. There's that there's that middle step of like validating, you know, understanding yeah. where you're at, checking in with yourself and then stepping out in more strength. And when I'm curious, when you think about those first two steps, you know, I love this, you know, more prescriptive approach to it. I'm curious, like how often are you kind of going through this prescriptive process? Is it something <laughs> that you're thinking about daily, weekly, monthly? Like what, when, when do you kind of go through this? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, It's something that I forget to do more often than I'd like, and I'm still working on making it more of a habit. Um, But it it, it definitely is something that sometimes I get, it's almost like identifying those triggers in my life to then recognize like, oh, okay, I'm in a box again. (laughs) Let's, you know, let's try to take control of the situation. Yeah. And I see lots of nodding heads. Would you guys do other people feel in a similar way? Do you feel like sometimes you're like, oh, I'm in that box um, and it could be because someone put you there. It could be because you, you put yourself there. Are you guys kind of thinking in a similar way? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I've, I've been told specifically by certain leadership I've had in the past, not at high spot, yeah. that 
this doesn't concern you. You right. don't need to understand how it was created or, you know, I, I'm a sales manager. You don't need to understand how we looked at the total addressable market. That's mm -hmm. above your pay grade. Yep. And your reaction to that can often be like, well, it's true. It is above my pay grade. And then I lean into it and I'm like, no, I want to be yep. in the C-suite. Nothing will be above my pay grade unless I start learning it now, then yep. I'll never get there. I'll never be strategic if someone, to your point, Haley, doesn't coach me on bringing all that like natural DNA that all of us have together and pointing it in yep. the right direction. Like you didn't wake up one day and was the VP of X, Y, and Z. People coached yep. you there. Yep. And um, I think just pushing back on those moments or finding people that don't see you in that box and want to coach you as well, right? Because I think you're always going to come across that. Absolutely. I've, I've definitely, I think the, the phrase, and, and yeah. not a high school either, but the phrase is, you know, keep your blinders on. And I was like, mm, well, that's, I'm going to go and do that exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes the box is like very, very explicit, um, but sometimes it is more of a feeling. And when, you know, you mentioned sometimes it might be, um, kind of self, self-inflicted, right? Like you might be, you know, putting it around yourself. Um, so the third step that you mentioned is about creating space. Tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the third step, this is the one that like, I, I exercise every day because some, you know, you don't have to take an audit all the time. Right. But yeah. it's about the action afterward. Um, I hope this is kosher to say on LinkedIn live, uh, <laughs> but I, the phrase that I am constantly coaching myself with is, what would a white man do? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because so I so a little bit of context there. Um, I grew up in between cultures. I am I'm Asian. Uh, I'm a child of refugees. I was born and raised in the U.S. Um, and I grew up like all through grade school. I had you know two different culture, I, two different contexts. Like I had American school context, yeah. and I had my home and Chinese school context. And mm -hmm. both of those contexts required very different things to mm -hmm. climb the social ladder. Right. Um, and so that contrast and that tension still lives on for me today. And I'm cognizant of that every day when I show up in, co in corporate America. Right. Um, and so, yeah. And so like my, my defense mechanism, like my natural state, especially when I'm uncomfortable is to shrink back not rock the boat and even to go as far as dismissing myself from the table. And admittedly, like I was scared to do this panel and I thought to myself, I even said to, you know, one of the coordinators, uh, you know, I have, I have my doubts about uh, what I can contribute amongst all these amazing women that are here, you know, today. Um, but anyway, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is um, what I've come to find is that when I choose to take up space to project confidence and advocate for myself that's where I've seen my career accelerate the most that, that's awesome and so you know I I really like how you're sharing how your background your perspective can really impact how you do or don't create space for yourself um I'm curious you know for you uh, you know and and anyone else here um as part of the conversation what are what do you think that management leadership can do differently to create a more welcoming environment and better create that space um, for people. So, you know, maybe when and then Kat. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to go first, but I'd love to actually hear from Kat real quick. Yeah, great. If, uh, awesome. I saw her raise her hand, so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it just popped into my brain. Um, <laughs> I think collaboration is such an important thing in meetings and in spaces that gets overlooked. Um, a lot of times people focus on themselves and, and their ideas and how they're just driving themselves forward. And to be able to step back and recognize um, that not everyone's communication style is the same. They're not all going to be me-centric is incredibly important. Um, yeah. Like when I, I, I grew up in a, I grew up in Hawaii and it was seen as, it was encouraged to be quiet and to let others speak and, you know, ask culture or yes, culture, whatever. Um, but I think that having, having leadership really drive collaboration as a, as a driving thing in meetings, in conversations, in the way things get done, I think could be very helpful. 
And that's actually something that we've talked a lot about at High Spot because being remote and being virtual makes collaboration increasingly more difficult, right? Like it's mm. so challenging. I mean, we've got these like weird dynamics with like, do you raise your hand on the thing? Mm-hmm. Zoom, it's just like, I mean, it makes the interrupting thing even crazier. So I think like, you know, I think when when leaders get to a certain level, communication and collaboration, a lot of times those things kind of can take a back seat because they're maybe just seem uh, like more implicit, like they're always going to happen. And I think, you know, Kat, to your point, being really explicit and intentional about communication and collaboration, if you do that, you will then create space for different people within the organization. And then they can bring strategic ideas, they can grow their careers, they can ask questions. And ultimately, it's just, you know, absolutely better, better for the business. Yeah, we're all very talented people here. So yeah, like great yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, so all of this does kind of have a little bit of a flavor of, you know, I know imposter syndrome has been something that, you know, has been a big topic of conversation, especially, you know, you know, it's Women's History Month. That's something that I see come up a lot of times in conversations oriented around, you know, women earning a seat at the table. Um, you know, Julie, I know this is a topic that you've talked about that you feel really strongly about. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience managing it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a topic I've spoken about on LinkedIn before, and I think that over the last two years, I've really um, felt more comfortable with overcoming my own imposter. And I can share a story where um, I helped this come to light. So um, about two years ago, I moved to London. Um, in 2019 and had the opportunity to be a high spot ambassador to go over to the UK and help um, launch our first international office. Mm -hmm. And there's always pressure around being the first of anything. And so in that moment, I just felt like I had such big shoes to fill. I had so many people I didn't want to let down. More importantly, the team in the UK um, that we were building, I didn't want to let them down. And so there was definitely a lot of pressure in that scenario. And I let my imposter take over at the beginning and tell myself, I'm not qualified enough to do this job. Are they sure they picked the right person? And, you know, I I really let it fester me, but something that helped me and that was key for me in this scenario and to overcome this was um, some things that both Kat touched on and just touched on, touched on, um, but was seeking out other mentors and that support system. So I had both a business coach, you Haley in that scenario, and I had mentors um, outside of the business, inside of the business, in addition to my friends and family. And I really made an effort to surround myself with other people that can advocate for me. And Jess, you were on my team. You weren't in my direct function. Mm -hmm. You were on my team. And I looked up to you so much just to get your advice, guidance. Haley, you met with me on a weekly basis, and it was really early in the mornings for you. But that level of investment really showed the support and care that I needed. Um, And in addition, I think that we had a really robust structure internally from our leadership team um, to ensure that I was successful. And so because leadership made a huge effort, um, we had a member of the leadership team flying over every month um, to come and visit, answer questions, over communicate. Um, That really gave me the positive validation that I needed and the reinforcement that um, my ideas were heard. And in all of that, I think the biggest thing that I've learned with having that support system is to lean into them when you make a mistake or when you have a failure and it's okay to speak up and they're gonna be there to extend a hand. Um, And that really allowed me to get out of my head and to do the work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, that experience that, you know, you went through and, you know, really learning to be comfortable being uncomfortable is, you know, such a, you know, growth experience. And I love the part that you said around, you know, if you don't know something or you mess something up, or, you know, if if you're in that type of situation, feeling comfortable leaning into the support system that you have around you. I know, you know, from my standpoint, that's like what I want the people that are on my team. I'm like, bring me the problem, bring me the challenge, like escalate it should like, cause I can't see what's going on if not. And then that really allows you to help people grow and develop and, you know, learn in that scenario. I'm curious, what would you say is kind of the biggest lesson, you know, now that, you know, you've gone through that experience um, and, you know, you're taking that back to your role now as a director leading, you know, a really large team, you know, at High Spot. what's kind of the biggest lesson that you 
you know, you took from that, that you'll, you know, always have with you moving forward? Yeah. Um, so I think like one of the challenges within the situation was the time difference, right? There's that small gap of opportunity for the most optimal meetings to be held, you know, our afternoons, your mornings. And before I went to London, I was kind of what my natural way to deflect was just being comfortable with kind of stepping back and letting the more dominant voice in the room speak up or call out or take the lead. And now I was in a position where I had to be that leader. And because of the time difference, you know, I was alone. I needed to be independent and confident and, you know, lean back on what I know and the confidence of why I was chosen for this position and take charge. And a way for me to do that if I didn't know was um, to have really great discovery with the team that I was working with and to use discovery to my advantage, to uncover the things that are going well, the areas we need help. And then when that optimal time for meeting with the US came to escalate those things where I needed help. Um, And so I guess, you know, what I really learned in that is, um, you know, ask questions, be curious, help move the conversation forward. And, you know, like, like you mentioned too, if you're, there is something you don't know, that is just as good to escalate it to the right people, the right support system to also help move the project or situation forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes people think that you're only supposed to ask a lot of questions, you know, early on in your career when you're in a new situation that you don't know about. I mean, even in my role today, I think like I'm constantly, constantly asking questions. There are things that come up where I like don't know what it is or I I don't have the context or whatever it is. It's why, why, why do do more discovery, whether it's a why question or whether it's an I don't understand. I think like no matter where you are in your career, no matter how comfortable or uncomfortable you are in the situation, asking questions to understand the why is just so, so, so important. Um, I think that's something that we can do ourselves, but also encourage, you know, other, other people to do. Um, I'm curious, Julie, um, you know, one of the things that we did also talk about is, you know, I remember the, um, way that you got that opportunity, right. Um, was, I remember, I think it was like a year before, um, you know, when I pitched the idea, um, to you, you actually had told me that you, you know, wanted to take on an opportunity of, you know, moving to another country, help starting up, um, you know, a part of our business there. And so, um, I don't know if you knew that you were doing it at the time, but I think putting your hat, <laughs> right. Putting yeah. your hat in was so important. And because we had that relationship, then I was able to go, you know, and, and advocate, um, for you in that scenario. And so, um, you know, is, is that something that you, you know, have kind of taken away, um, from that for future scenarios as well? Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, I don't think at the time I knew that <laughs> that is what I'm doing, but you did teach me a very valuable lesson. And it's something I've even passed on to other managers on my team, but it's this notion of that reflection exercise where you take a piece of paper, you write three buckets and you write down your strengths, your areas of opportunity or your areas of improvement, and then your passions. And I think this isn't just a one-time thing, but it's a reflection exercise that any individual in any career at any point in their life can do quite frequently because a lot of these things are going to change over time and a lot will stay the same too. But I think um, what's important is if you do this early on and you share that with your manager, with your business coach, with your mentor, that's Mm -hmm. where you'll get to start to get the guidance on the things that you are passionate about and they can help you write down short-term and long-term goals that align to both your strengths, but also the areas of opportunity that you can help grow in. Um, and then, yeah, I really think it's important, especially the passions piece, because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that those are aligned to what you're doing, all the hard work you're doing. Um, and then, you know, the rest will follow. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but, you know, before this, um, session, but, you know, some people know exactly what career path they want to go down. Jess, I know, you know, like you've known for a while, exactly what you want to do. And sometimes people don't, which is okay. And, you know, I couldn't have told you that I'd be in the role that I am today, two years ago, three years ago, how, however long ago there's, I couldn't have told you probably any of any of my previous um, roles, but that exercise that you mentioned, Julie, like write down your strengths, write down your areas of opportunity and the things that you're passionate about. And, you know, just, we were talking about this, your passions and what you're successful at, they usually end up being pretty, pretty similar. Um, that's a really good exercise to help you identify what's next in your career. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have the 10 year plan, but you might take on an, a, you might take on a role. I've actually done this before taking on a role that is specifically to develop 
the areas of opportunity. It's certainly not going to be the path that I go down because I don't want to do something that is not my strength, but I did it to help mitigate my weaknesses, right? And then, you know, kind of get back on path to go down an area that I'm more successful and passionate about. So I think that's a really good tool that that people can use. I know when you've, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about your, you know, experience in putting, you know, your name in the hat. Um, has there been like a specific scenario that you can think of where, you know, you maybe were a little hesitant doing that and then you did it and it kind of paid off? Yeah, um, this, uh, it's not an exciting story. So let me just set the bar low here. But <laughs> it's something, it's something that mm-hmm. I have reflected on recently because um, I, it's one of my proudest accomplishments at High Spot. Um, so uh, relatively early in my time at High Spot, I was able to work on an account with Oliver Sharp. Uh, for those who don't know, Oliver Sharp is one of High Spot's co-founders. He's a genius. He was the original services executive who implemented pretty much all of our customers in the early days. Um, And so working alongside him was a huge privilege um, and the account itself was one of our largest customers uh, to date. And so there came a day uh, while we were working together and I distinctly remember this this moment, there was an email chain, internal only, it had Oliver on it, it had another services team member and we were talking about the account. And the other services team member goes, hey Oliver, weren't we looking to transition this off of you? Um, and I remember staring at that email, I was sitting at my desk in our old office, staring at that email. And I was like, I have a choice here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can either do what I normally do, which is wait to be called on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, wait for someone to tell me when I think you can do this. Let's have you do it. Right. I could either do that or I could choose to channel my white man in corporate America <laughs> persona <laughs> and volunteer myself. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I decided on the latter. I shot an email back, I hit reply all, and I just said like, hey, I'd be happy to take this account from Oliver, but you know, I'll defer to the leads to make the best choice. Um, and I was really nervous. I kept checking back to see what Oliver would say. <laughs> and uh, late, later that day, I did get an email back saying like, great, when let's work on transitioning this account over to you. And so to this day, uh, serving that account, serving them well is again, one of the accomplishments I'm most proud of. It's also developed me. I've grown a lot. Um, and it really put me into a whole new playing field in a customer facing role, given the size of the customer, you know? So, yeah. yeah. That's, that's awesome. I, I love that story. I think it's so important that, you know, we talked a lot about mentorship where, you know, people, you know, can't advocate for you, but advocating for yourself. I know like for me in my career, like I pretty much asked for every job that I've had, um, you know, I've (laughs) actually, so, um, you know, advocating for yourself is, you know, is, is really important. And I think that, you know, in that scenario, when, because you were doing so well, it's probably a no brainer for Oliver, right? He's like, yeah, absolutely. Let's transition the account. I think another piece of it too, though, is that like, there might be scenarios where you ask for an opportunity and you don't get it. And that's also, you know, happened to me. And I think that the thing that's, great about that is that it's actually a way that you're seeking out feedback right because Mm. if you don't get it like let's just say when it would be like no like you can't have the account like the next thing would be like okay why what do I need to work on right Mm. so that I can improve and so it's a really great way to seek out feedback so don't be afraid of asking for it putting your name in the hat and if you don't get it feel like you failed like get back up the more times you ask the more opportunities you're going to get and just feel comfortable if you don't get it the thing you should do is understand why you didn't and what you can do to, you know, develop yourself or, you know, get, get better in certain areas so that you can get it, you know, the next time around. Um, All right. So we are getting um, close to wrapping up here. I do want to just kind of go around the group and, you know, in a sense or two, um, what would you want um, all of our listeners to take away from the conversation? So Kat, I'll start off with you. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say um, it can be a challenge to feel like you belong and a great mentorship can help you to uh, find that support. Uh, you deserve great support and ask for what you need in order to gain the confidence to use your voice and take the risks. I love that. Jess, what about you? I'm a strong believer that if you want to sit at the table, you need a solid plan. I have always had a five-year plan and that plan needs to be broken down into year by year, month by month, quarter by quarter, sometimes on a daily basis of what I'm trying to achieve professionally, personally, 
And I believe littering some of that plan with coaching will help you get there faster. That's awesome. Thanks, Jess. Julie, what about you? Yeah, I would say um, if there's one thing I want listeners to take away from this is you don't need to apologize for not knowing things. And it's okay to speak up and ask for help in any situation at all. And sometimes recognizing what you don't know and escalating that to the right team or the right support system can actually help something progress forward rather than hold it back. That's awesome. And that goes for like any level at the organization that you're in for for, for us. Yeah. (laughs) When, what about you? Yeah, um, just being cognizant, you know, we're in the middle of the workday for most people. Uh, Just a reminder to pause once in a while, check in on yourself, take a breather, and then go and take more space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I know it can be really daunting for people to, you know, earn the next challenge, get that seat at the table. But, you know, I think, you know, myself and all of us really believe that with the right support system and, you know, even advocating for yourself, you're included in your own support system. Um, You can always find success. Um, So as we come to the end of our conversation, I do want to close out by thanking all of our panelists for joining um, us here today. I also want to thank all of the attendees on LinkedIn Live and want to um, end with a call to action. Um, Our biggest takeaway from today is really the importance of supporting one another and finding that community um, and being comfortable reaching out, asking for help, like Julie said, looking for mentors, mentoring others. Um, being a coach for them, um, whatever you need to help you earn that seat at the table. And as we continue our work day today, I definitely challenge everyone here to find an opportunity to not only advocate for yourself, but advocate for someone else, whether it's yourself, whether it's a coworker, family member, friend, um, all of these little small actions and a lot of the stories that you've heard today can really help strengthen our overall community, especially during this time where we all have to be on Zooms all the time um, and will help ensure that you know we continue to make progress in the workplace. Um, so thank you again for joining us and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.